If you've never tried an enzyme in your kitchen, now's the time to get started. Well, today on WTF, we're going to look at amylase and show you how to make everything from potato rolls to refried beans, hummus, and even a cocktail. Hello and welcome to WTF, where we transform food here in the Modernist Pantry Test Kitchen. I'm Chef Scott Guerin. And I'm Janie Wayne, the owner of Modernist Pantry. So here on WTF, every week we tackle a really unique ingredient or some cooking techniques and we share some recipes that you can get started using these recipes and techniques. So if you like what you see here, remember to subscribe, ring the bell, do what you gotta do to get notified of our new content that comes out every Tuesday. So on this week's episode, Scott and I are going to be talking about amylase, which is an enzyme that has some really unique properties. And as you can see before you, we have uh, several recipes to share and we're excited to get to them. So Scott, um, let's start off with, an, uh, with a quick overview of amylase and kind of what is it and what, what does it do? So amylase is an enzyme that takes starch eats it up and breaks it down into sugars. Mm -hmm. And what that allows you to do is take a lot of different things and somewhat change the texture or even the flavor of them. All right, and I know there's a couple of different types. What are we talking about here? So there's actually three. There's alpha, beta, and gamma. And the only ones you have to really worry about are alpha and beta. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that kind of deal with food and, and how okay. they break down the starch into sugar. Mm -hmm. And alpha actually breaks it up randomly and, and allows it to kind of convert into sugar, whereas beta breaks it up in a specific uh, sense. So it breaks it up between different parts of the molecule. And that's more for brewing, but alpha amylase is what we use for um, you know, mostly the cooking techniques. Right, and that's what we carry here in yes. the store as well. Yep. So if you do are looking for just for cooking, the alpha should do great for, for what you need. Yes. Um, so if you're a home cook or you're a, a professional chef, what are some types of applications that you can use amylase for? How can it help them in their recipes in the kitchen? So whenever you're, you know, eating something uh, and you get a bit of, bit of that like grittiness from the starch, let's just say something as simple as mashed potatoes, mm -hmm. You can actually take amylase and add a little bit to your potatoes and it's going to eat up those starch molecules because starch, uh, even on such a granular, small, tiny form, you can taste it, you can feel it uh, mm -hmm. on your, your tongue. So you can actually break those down into a much smoother product, uh, which we are actually going to show off with our hummus and our refried beans because those are two things that are notoriously kind of gritty. Uh, they're delicious, but they're a little gritty and we made two that don't have any of that grittiness. Yeah. And I know that a few weeks ago we had another episode about diacetic malt powder mm -hmm. and that was episode number 147. The link is in the description below if you want to check that one out. Really fun, like a lot of great yeah. recipes in that one. Um, but I know that diacetic malt powder also contains amylase and people are always wondering, well, can I substitute one for the other? What's the difference and the relationship between those two items? Yeah, so diastatic malt powder is made from sprouted grains that are then dried and ground into a powder. And then you take that powder, you add it to a bread or, or whatever you're adding it to, and it's going to do very similar mm -hmm. uh, things to what the amylase does. It breaks mm -hmm. up those starch molecules. Uh, where diastatic malt powder is great for those applications, like baking applications, mm -hmm. uh, you could still use amylase in baking applications as we did here, mm -hmm. uh, but you can also use it in other applications. And one good thing about the amylase is you need such a small amount. Mm -hmm. uh, it's geez, about 10 times less than the amount uh, that you would need of diastatic malt powder because amylase is just the enzyme where mm -hmm. diastatic malt powder contains, you know, the leftover of that, that grain that's you know, been sprouted and ground up in there. Right. Um, so speaking of usage, because we typically like to do everything by weight here yep. because it's the more accurate way to do it. Mm -hmm. So if you are using amylase in an application, what are some starting ratios that you might want to reference? So with the ratios, it's always going to depend on your recipe and what you want with mm -hmm. it. But I like to go from, it's a very small amount, it's mm -hmm. like 0 0.01 to 0 0.05% of okay. the total weight of uh, whatever the starchy item in your recipe right. is. So it's, it's a small amount. I like the, you can go a little bit higher, it's gonna act a little bit quicker, and it's great if you just cook the item after, it completely you know deactivates the enzyme, so it's not gonna continue to work. It's absolutely safe to eat um, 
you know, raw, you don't have to cook whatever your product is. But if you get it to a certain point, you know your recipe, you can cook it off and it just, uh, it dies just above 158 degrees, I believe. Okay. And then just to, for people's reference, like 0.05% of like a thousand <laughs> grams, that's what, five grams? That's five grams. Yeah. Okay. So, so a really, really minimal amount per kilo. Yeah. It's a very right. small amount. Okay. So I know that you have um, several different applications here. We have like, I know you did a baking application and a couple of savory applications. Yep. Do you want to get into any of them? Sure. We'll start with the baking application mm -hmm. because this kind of ties into that diastatic malt powder episode mm -hmm. uh, where we actually made donuts and bagels. So if you haven't yes. watched that episode, it's probably a good idea to you know, oh. click the link in now the I'm thinking in about donuts and bagels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we're actually making my favorite burger. It's a burger that I uh, put on one of my menus. Um, shout out to Sauce Wings in Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, this is the 3B burger, so it's bacon, borson, and buffalo. And mm -hmm. we have our buffalo sauce from our, um, you know, our big game episode. Uh, so <laughs> we have that, and then we also have borson, which is gonna be on the blog going along with this recipe. And then we made a blended burger. So we take about 20% of the meat out of the burger and add in uh, raw mushrooms, so you get a little bit more savoriness to it, mm -hmm. and you don't have to use as much beef. Okay. So it's very simple. And it's healthier. Uh, yeah. So we'll talk quickly about these buns. Mm -hmm. um, these two buns are the exact same. They have the exact same amount of amylase, everything in them. Mm -hmm. But one of them has a natto seed because we're going for like a potato roll that is reminiscent of a Martin's potato roll. But okay. I put a lot of sesame seeds on them because I like that texture. Mm -hmm. So one of them has a little bit of a natto seed right here on the side. You can see that kind of classic uh, yellowy mm -hmm. uh, potato roll. Um, but this is a potato roll without them. And this is just showing you that if you wanted to make this recipe and you don't have a natto seed and you don't want to go somewhere else to buy a natto seed, mm -hmm. generally you have to get it on the internet, right. uh, you can absolutely make the roll and it's going to be perfectly fine. And okay. as you can see, either one is going to toast up beautifully mm. because all that extra starch has then been converted to sugar. So then when you uh, try and crisp them up, you get that nice crusty shell on the inside as well as the outside. So very simple, I'm gonna take this top, just put it off to the side for now. I'm gonna take our hot sauce recipe, and I'm gonna put some right down on the bottom. And you don't wanna be stingy with it, <laughs> because this hot sauce recipe has butter in it. And that butter is going to mellow out the hot sauce, but you wanna be able to get that acidic bite, because the thing that's going on top is pretty heavy. This is borson cheese. This is a homemade borson cheese. So we have cream cheese, butter, uh, Parmesan cheese, some herbs, it's uh, thyme and oregano, and garlic, raw garlic. Make sure you use the raw garlic because then it's going to give it that little bit of bite to it. Mm. And this is a really great recipe because Borson cheese is a bit expensive, but if you can make it at home out of things like right. cream cheese and butter, mm -hmm. uh, and you can gear it towards your taste. So we're going to put this right on top. It might crumble a little bit. And blended burgers are like all the rage right now, isn't it? Yeah, it's good because it cuts down on cost, so if you're selling burgers, mm -hmm. it makes total sense to add a little bit of something that's going to cut down on the cost, but it bumps up the flavor immensely, mm -hmm. right? Because you're getting all that extra umami from the, the searing of the mushrooms, and they sear perfectly. You can see it didn't add any extra water content. Mm -hmm. So I just did like a smash burger. I made a meatball. I put it into a super hot pan. I spread the sides out so you get that nice crispy crust over the top. Mm -hmm. And then bacon for your health. So a little bit of bacon on top. And when the burger's hot, you press this down and you allow that borson to start to melt. Jay, we'll give it a little bit because I just cooked the burger not okay. too long ago. So let's give it a little bit of time before we bite into it. Okay, uh, but it I'm looks sure delicious. You want to. Yes. Looks like a, I would have to like, what, what did that yeah, snake do? Just give it a good, good press. Yeah, you unhinge your jaw unhinge just to get a, a nice bite out of it, <laughs> but it's gonna be worth it in the end. Okay, that's awesome. I mean, it looks delicious. And I was all like, oh, the mushrooms make it healthy. It doesn't, but it's going to be <laughs> delicious anyway. A little bit of healthy. Yeah. So a little go. healthier. Yes. <laughs> so we, we do have other things that, that we've made with them. And I, I think the one kind of crowning achievement is making a hummus that doesn't have any grittiness to yeah. it. Yeah. And I'm just going to maybe move yeah, this around a little bit so we can get sure. a good look at this hummus. And we'll yeah. If we can, we can actually the bring over the refried beans as well because they're Sweet. under the same concept. So. Okay. These are, you can, you know, soak your own chickpeas, peel your own chickpeas, do whatever you want. What I did is you can take a canned chickpea. Mm -hmm. I like to put them into just like a vacuum seal bag. If you don't have it, you can just put it into a container. Mm -hmm. But then you can take that, you know, bag and you just 
put it into a, uh, a sous vide if you have it. Mm -hmm. If not, just cook it to about 104 degrees so you're very slightly warming it up. And at that point, um, between 104 and 149, you can then activate that amylase and make it, you know, thrive. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's going to eat up those starch molecules, create the sugar. So this is a little bit sweet, Okay. but then you balance it out with your flavors. So there's roasted garlic in here. We garnish with a little bit of chopped uh, fresh oregano, some olive oil. So when I take it out, I pop them into a blender and usually you have to be kind of careful because chickpeas are very starchy and those starchy mm -hmm. molecules become gummy when they're yep. blended. But this one I'm able to make into a blender put the olive oil directly in, make a really beautiful tight emulsion out of it, and then we have a extremely stable, flavorful, smooth hummus. So Jane, if you wanted to try that now before you dig into your burger, I go will. right ahead. So Yeah, and while yeah. I'm doing this, so quick question about what you just said about sugars, right? Mm -hmm. So because the amylase is converting the starches into sugars and it makes things sweeter, mm -hmm. if you're doing a recipe, should you cut back on the amount of sugar you're already using, or is so, it not significant? So with this recipe, there is no sugar that generally goes into hummus, but with this, you know, the, the burger bun or anything else, you can keep the recipe the same and you can just add in a little bit of the amylase. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily mess around with it too much because you want that even browning and everything. And you're going to get that from the amylase, but if you completely take out the sugar, it's going to affect, you know, how the yeast works at the beginning of the uh, proofing process. So yep. I would keep your recipe if you're just adding it to an existing recipe. But if you're developing a recipe and you find that it's too sweet at the end, yeah, then definitely bump it back. Yeah. And this is really simple. Like I personally actually don't love hummus. <laughs> like I is for the exact reasons that you're talking about, I find it to be gritty and I find it to be gummy. Yes. And this is like neither of those things. It's so smooth. It almost feels like I want to say like a mousse or like a cream, right? Like it's really got that really creamy I yeah, it's from, smooth, the, from the emulsion too, because yeah. you're getting that olive oil directly in there uh, and the there's no grittiness. That's the biggest thing with that, is that it's just not gritty. And usually hummus, especially made at home, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to cook these beans, you know, uh, out of the can. You don't have to cook them more to kind of break it down. You can just add the amylase and just, you know, heat it to a low temperature yeah. for about an hour, hour and a half, and then you can go on and make... Uh, your hummus. Yeah, I mean, I love it. I would eat. I would eat this hummus like all day long. And the same concept mm -hmm. goes for these refried beans. Now, mm -hmm. I don't. You don't have to take a big spoonful okay. of the refried beans, but uh, if you were adding it to something, yeah. generally, it's you know, it's dense. It's uh, it's very dry, and and a lot of people don't like it for that reason because it's kind of like a paste. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, we have to melt a lot of cheese on top of it, get that fat in there, so it moves around. But with this, it's a nice, smooth refried bean that you can put on. You can make like a queso fundido or something mm. like that. Um, with the refried beans, you can make a bean and cheese burrito, which we actually made yesterday just for fun. Mm. And uh, so you can do this and you get that nice, smooth texture. And this one actually gets a little sweet, so we we uh, bumped up the salt content and just a little bit of the acidity that we added to it, uh, just so it's not a sweet refried right. bean. Right. And uh, kind of what, you know, I, what I love about these particular recipes, that it really kind of hits what I think is the modernist pantry sweet spot, which mm -hmm. is you're keeping the flavor and you're keeping the taste of it, but you're providing a different experience from yes. what people are used to. And I think if, if I was at a restaurant and suddenly I had this hummus and I had the refried beans, I would be like, oh, that's like so familiar, but so different at the same time in a really good way. Yeah, it's, it's a just great refining, way to stand out. refining yeah. the recipes that that you're so used to and, and making it different without actually changing much. Right. So if you want to be, you know, memorable, you want people to remember your dinner party or your, you know, or, you know, coming to your restaurant, it's mm -hmm. such a great way to just make small tweaks to, uh, to make a big difference, really. Yeah. And to cap off the episode, because I really enjoy MLAs. I think it's a, it's a product that should be used more widely. Okay. Uh, and it's so simple. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do much with it. You just kind of let it sit and it does its own job. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is a recipe from Dave Arnold. And he is, uh, hey Dave. he's an absolute master and he, uh, I've spent a little bit of time with him here. And uh, this is from his book, Liquid Intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, where he basically takes pectin X and he adds it to bananas with some rum. Mm -hmm. But if you're using a fresher banana like this, there's a lot of starch content to that. Mm -hmm. yep. And with that starch content, it can kind of alter the flavor. So what I did with that is I add some amylase with the pectin X, and then I cook it at 104 degrees uh, with some rum. And what that does, is it breaks down those starches into the sugars. 
and then I'm able to pass it through a spinzol, which is a uh, household or a kitchen use uh, centrifuge, mm -hmm. which will Invented then take by it. Dave. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> takes it from this. This is just the puree of the rum, the bananas. Uh, a little bit of amylase and a little bit of pectin X. I pass it through there and I have a crystal clear banana juice. Now, if you've ever tried to juice bananas in a, uh, you know, just any juicer, it mm -hmm. just turns to putty, yep. right? It turns to like a mush and you get no juice out of it. Mm -hmm. But you're able to make a nice cocktail, a banana rum, which Ooh. you don't need anything else. And Janie, you can have a nice sip. Yeah. I mean, a don't gulp, drink right? Too much. It's 1028. I'm not. Mm, it's really nice. It's very nice, right? It's just pure banana flavor in here. You get that mm, so good. That real banana flavor, mm -hmm. which we all like. Yes. Uh, and mm. the rum is extremely mellow uh, yep. after you know going through the entire process, but mm -hmm. it is still a, an alcoholic beverage. So I would suggest you know looking at that book. There's a million great recipes, and if you're going to use a fresher banana for that recipe, add a little bit of amylase. It's going to help break down those starches. Yeah, and if you're like, what's Pectinex and what's a Spinzel? Uh, I would recommend checking out episode number 109, all about Pectinex first, uh, which, which is another wonderful product, and links in the description below. And then uh, you can go on your, your beverage journey from there, because that's a lot. there's a lot to explore right there. So Yes. <laughs> so I think we should round it out, and then uh, you can eat that burger. Sweet. The entire thing on camera. All right, one bite. <laughs> all right. So, uh, do we have any anything closing to leave the people with while I take a bite no, of this burger? I think burger? we pretty right. much covered, uh, did a good primer on amylase. And, um, I'm not going to go crazy with it. It's going to get real messy real quick. <laughs> it, it's just, you know, uh, don't be worried about the, the small amount that you need for it. If you happen to, to not uh, overdose, but add too much of it into your recipe, it's absolutely going to work. It's going to be fine. You're, you can eat amylase. It's something that our body actually produces naturally anyways. Uh, so you're not going to have to worry about that. Um, what do you think of the burger? Um, it's super delicious. The bun is really, really nice. It's got, it's very light. It's very like fluffy, but it's got like the right amount of mouth. So it's not mm -hmm. like entirely like being mushed to death. Yes. Yep. So. This is like a perfect meal right here. You got your burger, hummus, refried beans, guac, Two and then uh, yep. yeah, and then your cocktail. So yes. this will be lunch now. Okay. Well, thank you very much for watching. And from here in the Modernist Pantry Test Kitchen, I'm Janie Wang. And I'm Scott Guerin. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, like, comment, and subscribe and turn that bell on because it notifies you when we drop a new video. If you like any of today's recipes, go to blog.modernistpantry.com. There you'll find recipes, ask a chefs, and tips and tricks, and more. And if you have a friend who you think would like this video, share it with them. And to get any of these great ingredients, just go to our website, www.modernistpantry.com. And until next time, we'll be here in the test kitchen, helping you create memorable and magical experiences.